my job is to introduce us to this conversation with Edward Norton. Edward is not here, here with us yet. Uh, he's seeming to have technical difficulties on his side. Um, and so we're going to uh, we're going to just have to wait a couple minutes until he shows up. Uh, but while we're waiting for him, I thought I'd tell you about him. Edward Norton is one of the most celebrated actors of his generation and has starred in, produced, or directed over 30 films. Uh, but he has interestingly a parallel career, career which is uh, less known about as an entrepreneur, as an investor. He actually ran a uh, incredible company that uh, actually is its CEO uh, that recycles and process waste. He's an investor, he's an activist in environmental sustainability and in technology ventures. He currently serves as the United Nations Goodwill Ambassador for Biodiversity and for nearly 20 years has served as the board chair of the Maasai Wilderness Conservation Trust, which is something that we'll be talking about um, uh, more uh, in a bit. Um, and that focuses on uh, preserving endangered wildlife and threatened forest systems, forest systems in Kenya's iconic Southern rangelands, but also doing it in a way that preserves the, uh, the local indigenous Maasai community and uh, the, the people and their livelihoods. Uh, and so um, can't wait till he joins us. Uh, um, so by the way, just a few technical things. Um, uh, uh, we have turned your audio and video off. Uh, but there's a time in which we will turn them on. We reserve time for questions. So the last 15 minutes of this will be questions. Um, uh, please post your questions uh, in the Q&A panel. So below uh, um, there's a Q&A box. And if you uh, type in that, we'll read those and we'll use those for uh, to feed into the conversation with Edward. We're on for an hour today. We'll respond to as many questions as we can. Uh, this recording is a, of the conversation will be made available on the Garrison Institute website. Um, and today's concert conversation is sponsored by Gratitude Railroad, which is a community of extraordinary investors, I'm proud to be one of them, who are inspired and dedicated to solve environmental and social problems through the profitable deployment of financial, intellectual, and human capital. And I encourage you to go to the Gratitude Railway website, railroad website, and look at the uh, really interesting work that they're doing too. Um, ooh, so somebody asked, since we're waiting, could we talk a little bit more about founding the Garrison Institute? What a wonderful question. Thank you. And just, uh, I'm going to just do one thing. Monique, have we heard from Edward yet? We got an email saying he's signing right in. Yes, yes. Um, his assistant is telling us that he's coming in um, imminently. Okay, great. So uh, my wife and I, uh, ha, there's the two parts of the story. So uh, in my work, I, did a I do a lot of work up and down the Hudson River Valley. Our company is national. Uh, this is my work outside the Garrison Institute. And I was working with many not-for-profits in the Hudson Valley to help them um, uh, green and renovate their buildings. And as part of this, uh, we came across uh, the Garrison Institute as an abandoned building that the uh, Catholic or local Catholic order owned and wanted to turn, uh, wanted to sell because they, the order had declined and they no longer needed it. And we worked with the Open Space Institute, a fantastic not-for-profit that's been preserving land up and down the Hudson. And they wanted to buy the land that surrounds the building, but the only they were only allowed to buy it if they had a user for the building. They couldn't find anybody who wanted to use it. My wife, meanwhile, was the executive, Deanna Rose was the executive director of a Buddhist not-for-profit called Jewel Heart. And Jewel Heart was looking for a retreat center. So we thought it would make a great Buddhist retreat center. And so we proposed to buy it or to receive it from the Open, Open Space Institute. And that would unleash them to be able to buy the site, make a long story short, we reached out through connections to His Holiness the Dalai Lama, who said the world has more than enough Buddhist retreat centers. What it needs is an organization that connects inner spiritual development with outer transformational action in the world. 
And that became the founding premise of the Garrison Institute. And then we worked with many, many people who put together all kinds of networks of people. Deanna traveled the country going to other retreat centers and centers of intellectual thought and action and began to develop a strategic plan and frame what, were, what might the Garrison Institute become. We opened our doors in 2003 with this mission to connect inner development and outer transformational action. And um, very early on in that development, what Deanna observed was that many of our customers were frontline care workers. They were social workers working in domestic violence shelters. They were hospital emergency room workers and others. Edward, you've joined us. Hi, Jonathan. Hey, so, you know, I'm just giving a very brief overview of the Garrison Institute. At any rate, what grew out of that then is this, one of the first connections between inner and outer, which we call contemplative based resilience, which is, um, understanding that the people on the front lines of care, and we see this enormously during this COVID period, uh, suffer from a form of what's called vicarious trauma. And uh, if you go to our website and look at, at CBR project, the Contemplative Based Resilience Project, you can learn more about it. Edward, I have given you a, an introduction so uh, about your life and your work. So let's dive right in. All right. Oh, I'm happy to always happy to be talking to Jonathan Rose. All right. So first, um, I want to talk about your background, and maybe we'll start with your grandfather and your grand and your father, and kind of just very briefly their trajectories and how that informed your life. Um, yeah. Well, I, I, I grew up, I, I grew up in a household of people talking about doing uh, important things, whether it was uh, affordable housing, solving affordable housing uh, puzzles or conservation litigation and, and the dynamics of um, uh, environmental preservation. Uh, my mother was an edu a career educator and, and worked for the, then later worked for the, she was a teacher and then later became the educational grants director at, a, at the Abel Foundation in Baltimore. And my uncles were activists and it was just, um, I was lucky. I, I, uh, I literally remember people sitting around Thanksgiving dinner tables talking about building organizations. And um, it was, it was a, I had a household of, of um, adults who were who were prioritizing uh, the impact they could have and not the money they could make and and they all seemed very heroic to me so I I, I really did kind of grow up in that kind of environment and um, and and my granddad and my dad and my mom they're all still quite heroic to me in the sense that they the priorities that they set in their own lives were were very much about about the world at large, um, not really, they weren't careerists. And uh, um, I'm still, I'm still kind of trying to fill their very big footsteps. Great. So let's talk a little bit about that. So you, so you grew up with this fantastic, by the way, I just want to elucidate a little more. Your grandfather was really famous for uh, Jim Rouse for investing in the city, bringing back the city at a time in the 60s when and 70s where cities were on fire. He was on the cover of Time magazine as the man who like was going to rebuild cities. So this, and he brought together environmental justice, social justice, uh, as a leader in thinking about affordable housing. So you have that urban background and your father is deeply involved in environmental conservation and you yourself yeah. have spent a lot of time in the conservation land. And so in many ways, your work brings together these two things, this humans and nature interface. Yes, and I think, um, you know, I, I think uh, my grandfather understood this, maybe not at the, at the deep technical levels that we've, we've advanced to, but I think, um, you know, we, we've, we've certainly, I think we've certainly realized that, that housing is environment um, mm. that, you know, we know now, for instance, that the built environment, in other words, our, our development accounts for about 40% of greenhouse gas emissions. So the way we build, um, it, it's not just, you know, access to housing, access to the social services um, 
uh, the, the stable platform of home and social service support is socially important, but but low income communities also tend to disproportionately be affected by dirty sources of power and um, lack of open space. And these have, you know, we what was notional before, I think we're getting better and better at quantifying in the same way. I think we're also understanding that that environment is not just um, spiritual. Uh, nature is not worth preserving just as a spiritual value. It is, in fact, our economic fabric. And we understand that more and more, too. We understand that nature and ecosystems actually are literally infrastructure, um, not, not to take the spiritual component away from them, but the more that we've understood nature as a part of our economics, um, and the built environment as part of our, our environment, uh, I, I think the better we're getting at um, getting to a, a real kind of holistic understanding of the value of the way that these things are, are all integrated. So Dan uh, Goldman has a wonderful phrase. He says, you know, there's a mistake in medicine because we call, um, a, a, if you take a, 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 a drug, a prescription drug, you know, we say it has it's, it does like a certain thing, it has its effects, and then it has its side effects. He says, the reality is they're all effects, every single one, they're not like, you know, from the human body point of view, they're not side, it's just from our perception, their side, because we kind of decided certain ones were mean, certain ones are side. In the same way in the environment, we call the side effects externalities. So we kind of say, well, right. you know, I'm creating, energy to power a society and overcome poverty or whatever, or create jobs. And then the pollution is just a side effect. But that's just us putting it in a different mental category. It's as important a fact as all effects. And so this mental model that there are main effects and side effects has actually led to enormous both environmental degradation and social degradation. So what you were just talking about is yeah. an account, a new accounting system that begins to look at them all so that you can't run away from your effects by calling them side effects. Yeah, a real light bulb moment for me. I mean, we, we've been talking about that. Um, I, I, met, I met a guy um, uh, who I, I think you may have met him too, Pavan Sukdev. Uh, oh, yeah, sure. Pavan, yeah, Pavan, Pavan ran, uh, he ran commodities trading for Deutsche Bank in Asia. I mean, he was a commodities trader, literally. Um, he wasn't an environmentalist per se, and he, um, prompted by his own daughter, he, he says, prompted by his daughter saying, why doesn't air and water cost anything? Mm -hmm. He realized that, that his answer was a rationalization. He said, well, because it's free. And then he said he knew that was a lie the minute that he said it, and it, and it set Pavan on this path as a commodities expert to probing why don't we, why do we externalize the cost of ecosystem services of natural resource capital, because it is capital. Um, and he ended up being the author of this really seminal piece of work called the TEAB report, which is the economics of ecosystems and biodiversity. There's been a lot of, of, uh, of work in parallel. There's been a lot of similar types of work, but the TEAB report was one of the first things I read that really persuasively made the argument that if we try to calculate GDP while externalizing degradation of natural resource capital, we are lying. We are literally lying to ourselves economically. We are, we are giving ourselves credit for GDP growth when in fact we may be creating impoverishment um, that exceeds G not just on 100 year time lines, but he makes the argument within 15 year you know, thresholds. Um, and and this is a fascinating idea because sometimes, not to get political about it, but when you hear people argue, you know, the glories of the free market, um, it, it's important, I think, for environmental advocates to be able to come in and say, look, you're essentially, you're, you're privatizing profits and socializing your costs and pollution right. is a cost. Environmental degradation is a cost. And when you are passing that on to the rest of the world, and in many cases to the poorest communities, because as Pavan points out, there's a massive amount of unaccounted GDP extracted from natural systems by the poorest people in the world. You, you're, 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 o you're only a free market uh, advocate in, in, in your assertion, not in practice, because in fact, what you are practicing is a kind of socialization uh, of costs. And, and these, to me, this is, this is a, 
this is a real turning point. I think it's a very important um, tactical shift, or or at least let's call it a new a new asset of knowledge um, in in the fight for sustainability. Because what we're really saying is, um, you know, if you if you kick environmental costs and the down the road, what you're really doing is, is essentially borrowing from the future to make your balance sheet look better in the present. And um, and I think that that you know, look, let, let's ministers of eco economics in countries all over the world, they, they're, they're doing the best they can, they, but, but they need to be educated on um, how their decisions really crunch out over the next 15, 30 years. And, and this kind of work to, to actually quantify, though some people may find it um, a little bit uh, unromantic in the sense that lots of us still do believe that there's an intrinsic value to healthy, to nature and to life um, I think it's it, when, when you're confronted with the needs of eight billion people and growing, we 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 have to have we have to have a new sophistication in our defense of of natural systems as intrinsic to the economic model as well. And I think that's very exciting. I, I don't think it's it's um, at odds with a spiritual appreciation of nature. Um, I think it. I think they also intertwine. Um, and I think. Um, and in the same way, we've come to understand you and I, I mean, I think when you and I really got to be friends and allies was when Enterprise Community Partners, one of the country's great housing development innovators and organizations, realized it had to get serious about not just building healthy, affordable housing options, but realizing that, that affordable housing had to be green, affordable housing had to also be built sustainably and enter, you know, we were involved in the early days of enterprise launching its green communities initiative. And um, so I, I think these, these new wisdoms, these, these new sophistications are, are, com are all coming together in, to me, what are very exciting ways. It's a, I don't know, I often say it's a very strange time to be alive. <laughs> maybe it always has been, maybe Walt Whitman was right. And, and all, all times seem fractious and, scary, but I, I think that we're in such a strange moment of both feeling rightly that we're in a very dire and urgent moment with regard to planetary health, with regard to the, the intensifying negative feedback loop that we're creating through environmental degradation and climate shift and all of it. And it, and it feels really like an existentially challenging moment. Like we really could be putting ourselves past a tipping point that has that's very hard to come back from. And yet at the same time, knowledge, holistic knowledge and understanding is at an absolute peak. And the speed with which our knowledge and our understanding of these interactions is growing is so exciting. It's so exciting in many ways to, to feel that we're starting to, to, um, to see these things more clearly and, and, and have ideas about, about how to actually enrich people's lives while restoring environmental health. Um, and it's, so it's, it's, it's a, it, there's a lot of yin and yang emotionally in the moment that we're living in, I feel like. There definitely is. So we're gonna go forward in a minute. I just wanna wind back and catch us up on a couple of things. So Pavan actually used to be a Garrison Institute board member. And oh, maybe, great. if you can find it, uh, there should be a video of him speaking at the Satyagraha event at the Cathedral of St. John the Divine. We did, so Satyagraha was um, the Gandhi's phrase for truth force. And by the way, we're seeing mm. that in the streets today about George Floyd. And it was uh, passive resistance and nonviolent resistance uh, uh, to oppression with the force of truth. And we did a whole event about that related to uh, climate change. And Pavan was involved in that before he actually wrote the Teeb report. I just want to underscore, because you said it quickly, that we have a system today that privatizes profits and socializes costs. So we have an economic system today that says the more you can pollute, if you can get away with it, and uh, that just passes the costs on, that socializes, that passes the costs on to everybody. And that is in, imbued in the, in the essence of that is a selfishness that is the antithesis of all spiritual traditions. All spiritual traditions really ask us to make the whole our beloved. 
and to care for create. It can be different languages of care for creation or whatever. Um, so the other thing that Pavan figured out that was really interesting is current economic models use something called a present value calculation. And the further profits are into the future, the lower their value. So in an economic, in, in the present value, which every investment banker does, anybody who's making investment does, mm -hmm. go, well, like, you know, if I invest $100 and I get $5 back today, that's more valuable than getting $5 back 10 years from now. So what this does is it goes like, so if I completely destroy a forest and you know, the next generation of children are starving, well, that's 20 years from now, so it doesn't matter. And he, this, this is a positive um, uh, present value. He came up with this idea of negative present value, that actually what you do makes things worse today and they continually get worse versus they continually get better. Anyways, that mathematical shift is really the key to what he did. And yeah, and you know, it, it, it's funny because we see that. I mean, if you look at the American timber industry today, it's on its heels, right? And it's on its heels because, because it degraded its own asset so savagely that, that it's, you know, its returns have been diminishing, the industry's collapsing, et cetera. And, you know, Jonathan, my brother, Jim, was, um, he was, uh, for a long time, he worked at EcoTrust Institute in, out of Portland. Right. And EcoTrust did some ter terrific work on looking at how they could raise, kind of what you do with affordable yeah. housing. They raised, you know, for profit, they took their, they took their deep R&D on the management of forests and looked at the total ecology of a forest, looked at the different ways you can monetize a forest other than by looking at it as just board feed. Right. Um, they realized that you can get government contracts for uh, watershed restoration. You can do all, there's all kinds of ways you can, you can look at the holistic value of a forest and actually monetize that. And they, and they took that IP and they spun it out into you know, forestry funds, right. um, investment funds, which they acquired distressed timber assets and showed on a very short time horizon that they could actually outperform the TMO index uh, quite handily. And, and that's, that's, again, that's exciting. There, there, it's, it's, um, I think we're moving beyond, I think we're, we're, we're approaching an era yeah. where we can show that even in the short term, sustainable models of legacy industries return, give preferential returns even in the short term when, when restorative uh, models are, are practiced. And, uh, and I think that's true in, in, in the American energy sector too. I mean, you see the right. absolute collapse of the carbon energy um, markets all around us, even as renewables get cheaper and cheaper and more and more reliable. And, and you know, they're, we're gonna, they're gonna win on the pure economics of it, which is exciting. Um, the long-term returns, you know, people are abandoning, people aren't just divesting from carbon, they're also abandoning carbon energy markets because they know that they're shitty 30-year uh, investments. So, yeah, these are great models. So by the way, there's another company, Lime Timber, and not are they doing the same thing that EcoTrust was buying forests and preserving them, and then only sustainably harvesting. They actually use either horses or this incredibly delicate Swedish equipment that like goes in between the trees and just picks out the one you want and doesn't damage the rest of the forest mm -hmm. floor. But what they've moved on to is with each forest they buy, they, they, they set a sustainable yield of, of harvesting. They then build a local sawmill size to that yield and then create local employment. So now you're saying to people, you're part of an ecological economic system that is perpetual. Like, you know, we will always be harvesting only, you know, 3% of the forest or 2% of the forest. You will always have jobs. This sawmill will always run because it's not the slash and burn. So it's right. a much more sustainable system. So you try, you have taken these ideas and you've taken them to Kenya. So talk to us about that. Um, well, I, you know, I've, I've had my own evolution of the sort of work on you and I talked about this a little bit, but I think one of the things that's really interesting to me um, because I, I've, it, it's a pattern or a wisdom that I think has emerged both in, in like the US housing sector, if you look at, uh, as, as well as in global conservation. And that is, um, I think it's worth mentioning only because like there's, there's a point 
everybody comes to the point and say, what can I do? You know, what, what can I do? I want to be involved. What can I do? I care about this. What can I do? And, and many times, I think a lot of us, um, we look at a certain equation and on, and on a conscious or unconscious level, we say, well, what's my actual capacity? And sometimes the problems seem so big that we say, well, my capacity seems like a, my financial capacity, even my, the capacity of my effort seems like a drop in the bucket, again, on, on such a big problem. And, um, and one of the things I, I, I think one of the great wisdoms my granddad brought to bear in the way he built enterprise was enterprise as an organization does two things at the same time. It, it marshals and aggregates capital at large scale through a very clever impact investment mechanism called the low income housing tax credit, which was one of the great innovative ideas about how to move capital. And it runs these, you know, what you call very large capacity capital funds, the, um, th that, that it brings to bear. But then the enterprise, the foundation side of the organization, almost at the exact opposite, it worked on community scale capacity building, right? It, it was the recognition that we've had government scale financial capacity, we've had the markets. What doesn't, what matters is we have to have community scale implementation capacity. We need local expertise. We need people who live in neighborhoods, who know where the abandoned buildings are, who know, you know, what the community needs. And we need to train up um, what were community advocates to be housing managers. And we need to figure out a system by which we bring that capacity down into highly capable community-based implementers. And the great, the great, I think the way, the reason enterprise has built as much affordable housing as any non-governmental organization in America is that it recognized that you need 9,000 community-based nonprofits to, to, to make your partners and make the, the thousand points of light that, that really get that work done. One of the things I can't, over my dad's years running, found, he founded the Nature Conservancy's China Country program, and then he was the senior advisor to their whole Asia Pacific program. And he used to say to me, I can tell you, I can tell you with great accuracy whether invested dollars of the Nature Conservancy in a given eco-regional program will succeed or fail as a function of how strong the community-based partner is. Mm. And and I thought that was really interesting that the same is true in conservation. There's a lot of macro financial capacity. If there isn't strong, authentic community-based partnership, um, you, you really don't get traction on projects and they don't, they don't really succeed. You, just what you said, you need buy-in um, by the people and the communities whose lives are enmeshed within these, these ecosystems. And, and I started to feel there was a certain point in my own, you know, like I, I started becoming well known because I made movies and then I got, you know, I had conservation organizations come and say, will you be on our board? And I would look at, I would look at, they were, they were great organizations, but I would look at what I thought I could actually do. And I started realizing my, I might have a, a bigger impact in just working on helping build one good community-based organization where there isn't one, my own dollars. I thought, well, I, I can actually make a difference. Uh, and so I, I, you know, I, for many years, I just worked on community scale, helping sort of build community scale efforts because I felt my, my, my financial capacity and my knowledge and my, my advocacy could actually create, help create something from scratch and, and create one of those important nodes um, over time. I've started, you know, to see that almost by doing that, I learned enough to have a few bigger ideas about how to may maybe take certain global economic investment models and hijack them and repurpose them for, you know, because I think we we have we have this problem, which is. Um, in, in the conservation world, there's a lot of very noble work being done. It still suffers mightily from being funded ultimately in a non-sustainable model, which is mostly philanthropic grant making. And I think one of the real challenges of the moment is to figure out how do we, how do we underwrite the stewardship of critical ecosystems by communities in non-philanthropic ways? How do we build long-term um, 
long-term, you know, market-based models um, of, of, you know, re renewing, um, re renewing uh, economic underwriting for communities that, that take good care of, of natural systems. And that can mean, you know, remodeling tourism economics. It can mean uh, carbon credit markets, which are getting more and more sophisticated and robust. Um, it can mean, you know, it, there, there's lots of ways, but, um, but I think, uh, you know, Pavan really lit that spark in me, the idea that you need to look at um, natural resource capital as a portfolio of, of alternative livelihood models for what have sometimes been communities that are either pastoralist communities or agrarian communities or, you know, and, and figure out how do you, how do you get the, how do you create knowledge uh, and how do you get access to capital that allows communities to become in many ways, very innovative portfolio managers of the, of the resources around them. And that, and I've been working on that um, in, so, in some ways that are exciting. So tell us about, let's specifically talk about the Maasai. So what's the, what's the okay. core idea? What's the organization? What's it do? Well, yes. Yeah, so, so for, for a variety of reasons, having to do with my family and, and um, connection to a certain part of Kenya, I had some family over there. I, uh, my sister worked over there and I, be, I became aware of a, a really good, you know, very early effort. Um, there's a, there's an ecosystem called the Amboseli Savo ecosystem, which is, it's down there um, just North of Mount Kilimanjaro. It's where, it's where Hemingway uh, wrote the green hills of Africa and the snows of Kilimanjaro. It's the Chulu Hills are what he was referring to Hemingway's green hills of Africa. Um, it's an incredibly stunning, iconic, bio-rich um, area. It's the second largest grasslands migratory system in, in East Africa. And really significantly, um, unlike other parts of Kenya where Maasai communities have been essentially marginalized and disenfranchised from land title, this is an area where it's, a, it's, a, it's an enormous ecosystem. It's about eight and a half million acres um, of which nearly 1.8 million acres at the dead center is owned by these Maasai uh, communities by title. They, they, including about half of a forest that provides uh, the fresh water to nearly a quarter of Kenya's population. So, so you have this, you had this, I became very interested in this equation because here's an equation where where you have multiple national economic dependencies. In other words, um, something like 25% of all of Kenya's national park gate receipts come from right. the various national parks in that system. And this enormous fresh water story, this, this something like one in five of, of, of every citizen of Kenya relies on the watershed that comes from the forest on the Chulu Hills. Mm -hmm. And so you have, so, that, so what, the Maasai, what the Maasai communities do with regard to the integrity of this landscape has very significant, really significant for the, not just for themselves, but for the na right. nation's economy. And what we realized was we could, we could build, um, it took us six years, but we, we, we working with Conservation International and our organization and these nine constituent communities, we, we built a, a red plus, uh, which is the, the UN sort of highest standard for, um, carbon credit ish, issuances. We, so we, it took us six years to register the Chulu Hills Carbon Project as a, as, as a um, project that issues finance grade um, carbon credit assets, which we now sell to corporate buyers in, in the market. Um, we're, we're, we're working hard on that. That was, that was sort of a, a big step. But one of the things we realized is that it's sort of been sitting right in front of us for years. We've been working out there 20 years and they're you have good tourism partnerships with the, 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 the brands and the hotels that come in. But ultimately, commu uh, what we realized is that high-end tourism is kind of like a casino. It, it, leaves some, it leaves some tertiary economics for the community, mostly employment. But most of the value is private equity returns that are hoovered out to private equity investors. And one of the things we realized was, what if we, what if we gave these communities really low cost of capital, access to really low cost capital so that they could actually take the equity ownership of the high-end tourism that is exploiting 
their their asset, their biodiversity assets, their amazing right. landscapes, et cetera. And we have built a facility, we've built a, an impact investment facility that's now providing uh, low cost capital, re recycling the money with a modest uh, return right. to our impact investors. And we're, we're financing basically social benefit corps for these communities to own what has traditionally been the equity asset of the most expensive high-end tourism brands in the world so that those, those high-end equity yields are now kicking off to these communities where in the past they were getting breadcrumbs around the edges. And, um, and it's exciting. It's, it, to me, it's like, instead of coming up with, um, you know, a model where a community is selling t-shirts or, or cultural mm. trinkets, we're basically saying, no, 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 let's, let's look at the, the best returning private equity models in all of tourism and just hijack that by providing low cost capital to these communities so that they can be, um, they can be the investors in the, the core returns of high-end tourism. And for perspective, we've underwritten the conservation and community health program in that area at a cost of about two and a half million dollar budget every year. By year five of this model that we've built with the payoff of this low cost finance, these communities should be getting 10 to 14 million of net equity returns off this one uh, suite of developments. And so you're talking about you're talking about not only making a sustainable non-philanthropic model, but four or five X multiplying the, the underwriting that you've been doing philanthropically for this critical ecosystem and these uh, communities. And so it's exciting. I, I think that kind of thinking and for people, for people who have traditionally been philanthropic donors, what are they doing? They're, they're essentially providing seed capital at low cost, recycling their own capital and now creating this permanent um, this permanent sustainable uh, engine of underwriting this great work. And, and to me, that's really exciting. I think those, um, those light bulb moments when you, when you kind of realize how to twist the Rubik's cube around and, and, um, and, and move, move off of sort of the 1.0 version of how you've been doing mission-driven work is, is an exciting moment. I mean, I see you doing it with, with the Rose Affordable Housing Funds as well. So you know what's so uh, you know what's so interesting about that is you have reversed the system. So you describe a system that privatizes costs and socializes profits. So it's really a system that is taking. Now remember, this all started because the Messiah had capital. So it really shows also the importance of community ownership, community equity. Yeah. Um, and if you expand and our worldview, actually, the idea of ownership or equity. So like, like who, you know, who owns the, we actually divide up who owns the water. We don't yet divide up who owns the air. But if you think of the, the bounty of nature, you know, really interesting you think of the bounty of nature comes from something called the metagenome, which is, so you've heard that, uh, you know, humans share 50% of the, it's because all life is interconnected in this massive, astoundingly beautiful, interdependent system of information and energy flow material flow. And it's all that's this fast flowing organism of life. And um, so the idea that we would actually take some of that and commoditize it and cut off from others rather than let it be a regenerative model. Uh, is a flawed one. Um, so yeah, there's a there's a it's a uh, my brother has been I very articulate. My brother, yeah. What's that? Yeah. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was you just going to say I think that I think we I think we have to confront that. Um, look, the 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 let's call it the the last century of American philanthropy. Um, has uh, there's been a lot of you know noble intent and stuff, but but the idea you know if you're really honest about it, our biggest institutional philanthropy in the United States, which is by the way one of the most generous countries on earth, Amer Americans uh, Americans give on a per capita basis um, individually, uh, you know, very generously relative to other parts of the world. The 
but but our philanthropy is built on a model of people building wealth and then tithing something like 10 percent you know back yeah. to their philanthropic right. objectives and you can't you can't earn wealth. You can't. You can't earn wealth through non-sustainable extractive models, and then tithe back ten percent of that in a corrective matrix and expect it to work. <laughs> we we have to, like you said, flip it. The ninety percent has to be, the ninety percent has to be restorative, um, or we're not going to get there. And um, so. Go to some of the questions because they actually go to this. So the first one is, which you kind of answered, do you see a connection between affordable housing and conservation? Is sustainable green housing that can accommodate folks? And uh, he said, to do. And enterprise has been a leader in this. Um, sure. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah, you yeah. answer. Yeah. So <laughs> not only is there a connection, so, um, but the buildings can use more energy getting to and from the building than in the building themselves. So uh, when a building's out way out in suburban sprawl and everybody's driving to and from the building, uh, uh, not a huge cost. So when you when you locate mass transit next to walkable communities, next to uh, jobs, next to schools, next to mass transit, you improve the lives of the residents, and you improve. Uh, of nature. And one of the interesting other things, which is sounds contradictory to think about it, but for, for a long time we have thought that higher density cities are bad for the environment. But actually, the higher density a city, the um, right. that, that you have on nature, you kind of uh, I think of England with its fantastic cities and then green dots around them. So you actually preserve more land with higher density. Go ahead. Yeah, I also think of um, when I think of housing. I think you know. Um, I remember, I remember touring around with the enterprise team in Los Angeles, and you realize that um, air air quality, air quality in low income communities. You think, well, LA just has historically had cruddy air quality. It's getting much better, but why would low income communities have worse air quality? That well, you know, and you realize peaker plants, what they used to call peaker plants. I mean, um, the, the, the dirtiest power plants were often located, the ones they, they needed to turn on when there was an over demand, they were located in, in low income communities. And, um, and, the, and you know, as, as California and the city of Los Angeles have increased the purchasing of their energy from renewable providers, some of these peaker plants are just getting shut down and turned off. So literally, as the as the inflection curve of low cost renewables increases and cities like LA buy more and more of it, um, it directly affects air quality in low income communities because right. um, you'll you'll turn on these these dirty plants uh, less and less. And you know it's it's uh, there's always webs of connection that, that you don't really think of, but that are there. And um, I think, uh, I, I also think, you know, it's, it's funny. Um, there's an organization I'm on the board of uh, that's just, a, it's in North Manhattan called Harlem Grown. And um, it's, a, it's an amazing little organization. They, they take abandoned city owned lots and turn them into agri urban farms agricultural nutrition learning centers connected to some of the most at-risk kids in the in the city um in fact it's it's staggering the the uh the students at the schools 65 percent of the students at harlem grown's partner schools live in homeless shelters in in shelters and you just think to yourself how, how can over half of a student body at a school be living in a homeless shelter but but that's the case. And, you know, they've, they are, they are literally like changing, they're, they're positively inflecting the efficacy of the overall education program of these schools by involving these kids in, in they're literally, literally getting their hands dirty, making them understand, you know, plants, farming, soil, nutrition, the business model of selling um, their wares. And it's, it's, it's all, um, I think, I think, uh, 
you know, there's, there's a lot of ways that, that um, communities of risk and lack of access to nature, lack of connectivity to nature reverberate. Um, just a second. I, my, my computer died in the middle of that. Um, That's okay. So there were a bunch of questions that uh, for me just disappeared. So Monique, is it possible to repost those? Um, so there was another one though that I'd seen about profit that asked, uh, is it possible to have a um, nature and profit together in a society? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I, I'd like to say that I think, you know, um, I, I really think there are many dimensions in which we're going to see that models that are restorative will outperform. Uh, timber is certainly one. Like the, the, if it, the, the players in the timber industry that don't really start to get serious about restorative ecology will fail. They will, they will mm -hmm. fail. Right. Um, and, and the, um, cause they've cut them. They have literally cut their business model into the ground and they're gonna, they're already walking away from their own distress assets. Um, and others are going to come in and turn those, those distress assets into profitable, healthy forests. Um, but I think, uh, I think there's enormous profit to be made in, in better, more sophisticated waste treatment technology. I think there's, there's, um, profit to be made in, in clean energy. I think the clean energy sector is going to annihilate the carbon energy sector over the next 50 years. Um, it's already happening. Uh, I think as we get grid scale storage, which we certainly will, that, that is, that is like a, a technical impediment to, you know, to renewables notionally being able to provide base load that's going to be solved. That's on its way to being solved. And when you have grid scale storage, um, even companies like Tesla are starting to solve that for regional um, power providers all over the world. And I think, I think when we get to when we get that piece of the puzzle solved, and it's, there's not going to be this sort of baseload knock against renewables, and um, and and they're just gonna they're gonna atomize the the mar the, the margins on renewables are going to atomize the um, dirty forms of energy. It's already happened with coal, like. Is yep. coal profitable anymore? It is certainly not. Is solar yep. profitable? It's wildly profitable. Yep. Is wind profitable? It's wildly profitable. And and so, yes, I think resoundingly, yes, there's lots of money to be made in um, in every form of of uh, uh, you know the, the models of of every industry that are sustainably managed are going to outperform those that aren't. All right. So uh, somebody says, I am a student of Venerable Tupton Children of the Savrasti Abbey in Washington State, and they have a substantial portion of forest that they're harvesting a bit each year. Um, and they asked, could you speak with them about moving towards a sustainable system? But I thought maybe you could refer them to Ecotrust or Jim. Who, where, who would you send Yeah, them to? I mean, I, th I think, um, yeah, Eco, my brother's not at Ecotrust anymore, but Ecotrust, uh, Ecotrust, um, and I, I can't say I've checked in on, on this really recently, but Ecotrust managed a couple of um, forestry management funds that I know were looking at timber assets in the Pacific Northwest. And, and I know that they had had some, some um, people who owned large, large scale uh, forestry assets, family owned, and they were, they were preferring to work with them um, over traditional uh, companies because of their their management practices and stuff like that. I, I'm not an expert in that at so all, had, but, uh, so had, but so I think them, there's good work being done. Yeah, so have them check out either Ecotrust or the Pacific Forest Trust. Somebody else says, yeah. what can the average person do to help? Mm, you know, I, I think that, uh, look, I, I kind of assume that anybody who's on the Garrison uh, <laughs> a Garrison webinar is is um, a voter, and I kind of assume that that most people here um, understand that if we if we don't vote uh, if we don't vote these issues, um, we that, that that's important. Um, I think that uh, you know you know what I'm going to suggest. I, I tend to think. I, I tend to think, listen, I'll give you an example. I mean, 
I don't know what average means. I think lots of people have lots of different capacities, but I will say this. I think that I really do believe in the, um, you know, the power of many. I, my wife and I founded a company. Some of you might've heard of a long time ago. Jonathan was an investor. It was called CrowdRise. And we were, we were a crowdfunding platform for, we, 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 we did social fundraising for charitable uh, orgs. And we ultimately, we merged CrowdRise with uh, GoFundMe, which it's now a part of GoFundMe, which almost everybody's heard of. Just, just, just to tweak your brain a little bit. I mean, contemplate that this year, GoFundMe will transact between three and four billion dollars of charitable donations into fundraising projects of different types for nonprofits, for people directly, people in crisis, et cetera. And the average donation on the platform is still under $100. So you're talking about the same amount of money that the Gates Foundation moves, more money than the Gates Foundation moves on an annualized basis is being contributed in under $100 increments by people in these very dynamic crowdsourcing um, you know, projects and fundraisers. And I mentioned that only to say, I think that we should, we, can, we should never lose sight of the power of the disaggregated mass of us working on individual things. And I think in all of our communities, we're talking a lot about housing, we're talking a lot about conservation. All of our communities, I guarantee you there's no one on this who doesn't have an enterprise partner, community-based advocate working on housing within a hundred mile radius of you. And those organizations are so important. I used to love when I first worked at Enterprise after college, getting to know those people, the people who founded the Community League of the Heights or El, you know, El Barrio's Operation Fightback or the Gowanus Canal Community Development Corporation. I mean, these, you know, there are organizations like this in all of our cities and they need help, they need support. Um, and it, and, and uh, I think becoming an advocate for the local, the local implementer of these ideas near you, whether that's on a community restoration, community transformation, uh, you know, housing kind of uh, theme or, or conservation. My dad's great organization, uh, the Conservation Land Foundation, has dozens of friends groups that's, that defend specific nodes of the American um, public lands that have a conservation designation and you know that organization's effectiveness at defending national monuments and wilderness areas mm -hmm. again directly 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 a function of the fact that they bring empowerment and funding to these local friends groups so i don't think anyone should ever ever dismiss um the 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 local the local the 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 mm -hmm. the Really, we all can only do so much, um, and and I think uh, um, there are great local advocates uh, in your community, and those are the kinds of things that you know. Becoming a fundraiser who gets you know, someone can donate two hundred, but if they can find ten people to donate two hundred, two thousand bucks is often a meaningful contribution to those kinds of local organizations, and and most of us who are socially connected on Facebook and. All these things we, you know, we can do that. Like pe people, one of the things we learned at CrowdRise was that you can you can lever your own capacity with very little effort these days by by just saying, you know what, I am going to be a, an organizer of at least thirty people who I get to rally around a cause in our community that I support, and that that kind of um, being an organizer, being someone who says, yeah, my own personal capacity might be X, but I'm going to 10X it. I'm going to 10X it through my own network. That's that's really meaningful. That's a great answer. I'm going to ask you to make your answers a little shorter because um, we got a bunch of questions. Okay. So okay, one, fire away. Okay, so there are tons of young people coming out of management schools, business schools. Um, in light of the fact that the age of climate gradualism must be over, what would you say to these future business leaders to become a force for good in the world? Um, By the way, that question is from David Cooper Ryder, who is a business graduate school leader of force for good as a mm -hmm. teacher thinker. For he is a magnificent force for good in the world. Um, I would say, you know, we don't 
we don't need um, we don't need new social platforms. Like we really don't. Yeah. <laughs> we have enough of them, and they suck enough of our time. We don't yeah. need more games. We don't need um, we don't need uh, we we don't need tricky little innovations that find a clever way to make money. We need we need smart people to start to work on how to build businesses that solve serious problems. And I think um, it's not just that it's not just that uh, there's enormous long tail opportunity in that, but there is more satisfaction in it. I, I, I think that young people should absorb that. Um, I mean, American culture is, is still incredibly materialistic and very focused on the aggregation of personal wealth. And it's, we, we've made it like this iconic Olympian narrative of, you know, the Forbes 400, one of the worst, one of the worst, like, I, I think like if there's literally a thing, uh, one of the worst lists in the world, because like it does nothing but it infect people's brain with this notion that there's like some something aspirational to being on a list like that. And the truth is like, we, we need people to actually solve problems um, and working at solving problems is infinitely more satisfying in the long run uh, than chasing money. I guarantee, I, I promise that. And I think um, uh, we, we really do need people to, to focus on, um, on the serious problems. So this actually, interestingly, because you mentioned this is part of American culture, there's a question from Denmark, by the way, of several people visiting from around the world. And um, uh, he asks, uh, it's interesting listening to this from Denmark, a country resting on the idea of a strong welfare state taking care of problems. Do you see any new responsibility and awareness with private business and the whole world of impact investing? Do you see impact investing growing and becoming a force? Um, I hope so. I hope so. Jonathan and I talk about this a lot. Um, you know, I, I feel a little bit frustrated. Sometimes I get a little edgy about what I see going on in the impact investment world, because when, when traditional private equity investors suddenly throw up an impact fund and they're still taking two and 20 on it, um, so there's obviously a, a little bit of a misaligned incentive because if they're putting traditional, if they're producing, putting traditional compensation structures that are, that are based in, you know, uh, you know, market rate performance, let's call it that, then, then I struggle to, I struggle to believe in the authenticity of the impact component of what they're doing. And I don't want to say that they're all greenwashing, but Sometimes I think, you know, if you were really serious about what an impact fund would be, you'd say, look, it's what Jonathan said. What are we doing to hijack um, what has traditionally been the profit motive for managed capital and say, look, we want it to have an impact motive. We want to say, hey, look, we're in the lowest yield environment in our adult lives. Like government yields are negative in Europe, right? Government treasury yields are negative in Europe. They're, they're like, you know, a couple hundred basis points in the United States. What would have been traditionally called fixed income returns, like if impact, if impact funds can find ways to hijack quote unquote traditional private equity returns and put most of that into the purpose driven thing and return to people, you know, a, a 5% yield or something like that. I, I would rather see more people committing themselves to that kind of a model than to slapping a stamp right. that says impact on their fund and, and actually chasing market rate returns. Jonathan is one of the few people I know who I think is doing strong returns by on a market sense and also actually um, delivering really critical uh, community transformation impact. But even Jonathan has said to me at times, like he wishes he had less pressure. Uh, he, he could invest even more of the returns in the, in the, uh, more social services in the housing. And I think, and I think this is partly an investor mind shift. It's um, I think there are, there are people like Jonathan who would like to maximize the impact component of the returns, but we need investors to, uh, to um, change their parameters of their expectation. Um, on the other hand, let's, let's say a positive. You're from Denmark. I think we've seen 
a significant shift to show the power of the investor. The, 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 the Scandinavian sovereign wealth funds have um, some of the most stringent, let's call it ESG or environmental impact standards in the world. And the, that I know for a fact from friends in private equity that their desire to get funding from the Scandinavian sovereign wealth funds has forced them to get serious about ESG within their portfolio companies. And so that's great. We need, we, you know, investors have the power. They have the empower over the managed capital uh, folks and, and over the CEOs. And we, we need people. God, I wish, I wish CalPERS, I wish the, um, I wish big US institutional investors like teachers pensions funds and CalPERS and people like that would go the way that the Scandinavian sovereign wealth funds and actually exercise their power, you know? That would be great. I want to just highlight the other side of this. So I'm going to pick on one company, which is Facebook. So Facebook, we know, uh, makes a lot of money from advertising by promoting hate. And we've seen promoting or allowing racism to be promoted on its site. There was an interesting op-ed in the New York Times recently about a week ago in which a woman whose life work is in getting fake science out of, uh, fake medical cures out of and out of the medical business, posted privately to her friends on her Facebook site that she had breast cancer. And immediately she was inundated with cancer ads, cancer cure ads on Facebook. So Facebook was obviously looking at her stuff, but every single one she got of the hundred she got were all fake cures, you know, drug, you know, like in some obscure herb combined with silver colloid or something, all the ones that she knew scientifically because it's her profession didn't work. People who actually believed in that died because of it. Okay, so there's a whole bunch of things that we know that Facebook promotes and sells and advertises that are not good for society. Facebook's market cap as of noon today was $680 billion. So let us say that Facebook took all the fraud, all the promotion of racism, sexism, uh, by the way, they're the 94% of all uh, child sexual um, uh, abuse, uh, you know, uh, is trolling for kids, uh, minors and, and uh, abusing them, 94% takes place on Facebook. So let's say all that went away and Facebook's value went from 860 billion to 460 billion, 480 billion to 800 billion to 400 billion. It strikes me that that's its true value, that the extractive value on society is a fake value. So to me, part of the way we need to rethink the economy is to actually charge the companies back for their negative externalities and then look at what is the true contribution they're making or not making to the world. I like it, and uh, they're a fair target. <laughs> so I'm gonna to go to one final question. There's a bunch of questions, we can't get to everything, but this one goes back to the, another part of your life, which is the arts. And what somebody asked is, so how does the arts, how can the arts, what do the arts have to say about the issues of our time and how can they best say that? I think that um, I think the arts sometimes reflect. You know, it's a it's a real um, there's a feedback loop with the arts and society. I think the art sometimes reflects what's going on. Sometimes it amplifies a, a theme, and sometimes in in really special and rare instances, I think it it helps crystallize an idea and it advances, let's call it a meme, or it, it, it can inspire. Um, I think that, uh, you know, it may sound silly, but to me, um, you know, the, the, to, to this day, the, 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 the most broad, the wi most widely seen movie in the global box office ever was Avatar. Um, it, it's the it's still the top performing theatrical released film of all time. Um, and, you know, it is a story building a mythology around 
being integrated with nature being a heroic value and destroying nature being the definition of villainy in the film and the central emotional event, the emotional, the tragic emotional event at the center of the film is a tree falling, is a tree being knocked down. And I love that. I, I don't, I actually don't sort of think that's a small thing. I think a whole generation of kids grew up on that film and there's a bunch more coming. And I think Jim, Cameron is very conscientiously saying, I want to create a mythic structure in which nature has a heroic value, uh, uh, integration with, and, you know, and, and respect for nature has a heroic value and destruction of it is defined as villainy. And I, I, I really appreciate that. I appreciate that something that's that big of a pop cultural force has uh, a mythic theme in it that, that has so, so it can be in pop culture. I think I think documentaries, um, you know, are very are very can be very powerful um, illuminators of of things to a broader audience. And um, I'm in the middle of you know I'm in the middle of reading a novel right now called the o the Overstory. It won the Pulitzer Prize, mm -hmm. and it's about it's a not it's a dramatic novel about trees, and it's magnificent. It's really I, I've spent my life working in conservation and, and environmental protection. And it, this, it's, this is just like, the book is blowing my mind and making me feel reinvigorated actually, like, like uh, feeling like I'm not doing enough and I really shouldn't do anything else. It's, it's having a real, a, a real effect on me. And I think, um, so I, I, you know, I haven't lost my faith at all in, in the power of the arts to, inspire or underline or amplify um, progressive messages of, um, uh, you know, and, and I think uh, it's, it, the, all the good stuff fights for room to breathe uh, and, and to find an audience amidst a lot of um, stuff that's, that's kind of a, a blended up version of Xanax and, and high fructose mm -hmm. corn syrup. That's what a lot of our, our popular entertainment is. But, but I, I, I still, I still do believe that storytelling is very important. Um, the way we understand ourselves within the context around us really is a function of storytelling. I mean, even people's politics is affected by storytelling their, their values. And so we've got to tell, we've got to, we definitely have to keep trying to tell stories that, that help a younger generation, a new generation of advocates see themselves, see advocacy for these causes uh, as a hero, as a heroic narrative. Thank you. It's been fantastic talking with you, Edward, and your life so far has been a heroic narrative and long may it continue. <laughs> um, and Thanks. To, I admire to, all you're doing, as you know. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And uh, I love, the, I, everything Garrison represents, I think, is so great. Thank you. We really appreciate that. So to the audience, thank you for joining us today. Keep checking on the GarrisonInstitute.org for updated listings of future sessions. The recordings of conversations such as this one. By the way, the next ones that I will be doing is uh, Lori Anderson on uh, July 23rd, the musician, artist, performer, Lori Anderson. And on August 6th, in conjunction with the release of an amazing new book on planetary health, a conversation with Sam Myers, who is the founder of the um, Planetary Health Alliance. Um, if you'd like to support our programming, please consider making a donation at garrisoninstitute.org. And uh, again, we want to really thank Gratitude Railroad, which is our sponsor of this talk. And if anybody would like to sponsor another talk, let us know. May everybody be happy, healthy, and safe. Thank you. Thanks, Jonathan.